Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Just checking, folks. We're very glad to see you here on this nice, balmy day. Uh, let's turn to our scripture, which is from Isaiah 62, verses uh, 1 through 5. The vindication and salvation of Zion. For, for Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the vindication shines out like the dawn, and the salvation like a burning torch. The nations, nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You will be a crown of beauty in the land, in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Let us continue with our call to worship as found in your bulletin. And please read responsibly. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. 
How precious is your steadfast love, O Lord, O God! All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. At this time, please take a moment in silence and open your heart to God today. We will continue with hymn number 733, Marching to Zion. Be seated. And please join me with the congregational prayer. Spirit of God, make your present known to presence known to us. Lord God, you are revealed from the mountaintop to the sea. You are worshipped from the north to the south, from the east to the west. Heavenly Father, Help your people everywhere to look past the things that separate us, looking to the gifts of the Spirit that unite us. Let us remember that they are no strangers, only friends we have not met. May the Spirit of Christ, which seeks to make us one, guide our hearts and minds, and may we always seek the fullness of your grace in our lives. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. At this time, we welcome Pastor Jim McNair with us today. Good morning again. Good morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you 
lifting our voices in prayer and praise. We come with our askings for ourselves, for our families, for our friends and neighbors. We come with our laughter to share with you. The joy of coming together to be in worship, the chance to strengthen each other in our, in our faith journeys is always a joy. But to have family members in hospitals, hurting, in isolation, having them in fear, that is never a good thing, Lord. And so we pray that you will give us the strength for the days ahead, for the healings, for the depressions, for all those things that weigh upon us. We give thanks for the returning, for families that come together, for new births. In so many ways, we, we think we're telling you what we need, but we're, what we're really doing is showing our ignorance our, I'm having trouble saying the words, our problems because we don't acknowledge you in each and every moment of our lives. So forgive us for our unfaithfulness. Forgive us for our tardiness in coming to you and be with us each and every day. And as we pray, Lift our hearts, lift our spirits, show us the joy that you would have for us. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who, when asked, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Are there children for the children's message? Children, children of God, come forward. Come forward. Children of God. Tara, Jim, welcome. Welcome. Good morning to you both. Now, I'm going to ask you because I'm sure. Mrs. Wernie knows this already. Do you know what a compliment is? What is it? Oh, you know what? I need this to make it official. Or else. I'm slowly appealing. So, what's a compliment? When somebody says something nice about you. Absolutely. When somebody says something nice about you, you're absolutely right. So, have you ever received a compliment? While you were busy doing something else, while you weren't paying attention, you know what it, it's like? You're, like you're, you're playing a video game, or maybe you're talking to a friend, or you're on the phone. Let's see, let's see what it would look like. Because sometimes God is trying to compliment us, but we're not listening. You know, and this is kind of what it looks like. Mr. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hold yeah. on a second. Hold on. I, I got a, I got a call. Hello? Hello? Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. oh, yeah. No. No, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. yeah. I'd like the haircut. Uh, okay. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. No. No, he's going to. I really like your haircut. They already cut the, 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 the coach, but I don't think they're going to cut Barkley. No. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? I like your haircut. Oh, yeah, no, I don't think that the Steelers are going to cut the coat. I mean, no, it's fine. Okay, I'll let you go. Bye. Oh, well, yeah. See, that's what it can kind of feel like. The Lord is telling us all the time that he loves us, that he delights in us, according to Isaiah. 
you know, in that reading, we are the crown for the for the Lord, and He loves us. But sometimes we're so busy, so busy with our day-to-day -day activities that we just can't hear the Lord tell us that He loves us every day. So thank you, thank you very much, Jim, for your help. With that. So you have my help. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So, one way we can help ourselves pay attention to God is by choosing to give God our own compliments to Him. Because while we're doing that, we'll be more focused on the Lord. And then we're less distracted, right? And in fact, we'll see the writer in the scripture reading, doing that exact thing. The writer's giving God all the compliments about being faithful and righteous and loving. Another word we can think of it's similar that goes along with compliment here is praise. So when we praise the Lord, we are allowing ourselves to be closer to God and focus on Him. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, Dear God thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. And for caring us. Caring about us. And, for caring about us. and delighting in us. And, delighting in us. and thank you for telling us. Thank you for telling us. Even when we're not listening, even when we're not listening, help us to listen better. Help us to listen better, so that we can better receive, so we can better receive, and then better share your love, care, and delight. Your love, care, and delight. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. If you would please turn to hymn number four fifty four, open my eyes that I may see. service when we are given the, the joy of giving our gifts into the mission and ministry of God. So please come forward as the ushers direct you.
Please join me in a prayer of dedication. From your great love into our hearts, we receive your gifts. Now from our hands into the mission and ministries of your church, Lord, we lovingly give our gifts. May all these touched by them know love and blessings in their lives forever and ever. Amen. Be seated. Take a moment in silent prayer. The message today will be taken from the book of Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Hear these words. Now concerning the spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. 
to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each of us one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gail came up to me and she said, um, the church is going with masks. And I went, good for it, I'm not. But I promised her that I would stay on this side of the altar rail at least 20 feet away from everybody. Uh, I have my own concerns, both health and otherwise, as to why I don't mask. But I won't inflict myself upon you. So I'll just stand here if that's all right with you. All right. God, knowing that we were going to need help, dispatches the Holy Spirit to us. And the Holy Spirit, along with giving us what they call sanctifying grace, has, has Rick gotten around and talked to you, to you about the three different kinds of grace? No. Provenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace? Well, if he's listening, Rick, get on the ball. Uh, no. We as Methodists see there as being three kinds of grace. Provenient grace is the one that keeps us close enough to God so that at the right time in our lives, justifying grace can touch us and bring us to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord, at which point the Holy Spirit then descends upon us and gives us sanctifying grace to empower us for the rest of our lives. That's the short thumbnail sketch. I'm sure he'll do a much better job when he talks about it. But in the giving of sanctifying grace, we are each given what we need to be beneficial to the mission and ministry of God in the world. We are not called to be pew sitters. That's not our function in life, is not to pick out of our pew, stake our claim to it, give dirty looks to anybody who sits in it on the wrong Sunday. My mother-in-law, my wife tells, sis, tells stories about her grandmother. In Royer's Fort United Methodist Church, there's a small three-person pew right there and if someone who wasn't in the know came in and sat in it she would Lillian would never say anything about it but she would stand there until the person realizes that they're in the wrong place and once they moved she would graciously say thank you and then she'd take her proper place well but that's not what we're called to be we're called to be warriors we're called to be carriers of a message. We are called to proclaim the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ throughout all the world so that everyone will know who he is, why he is, and what they can receive from him, which is eternal salvation. That's our job. Does anybody want to take that on all by themselves? You have my permission. I didn't hear a chorus of yeses. <laughs> so, the Holy Spirit comes upon us at the time we accept Jesus Christ as Lord. Some people call it confirmation. Some people call it conviction. Whatever you feel like calling it, it is what it is. And that is us opening us up. We open ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as a reward for opening ourselves up that way, we are each given gifts. Some more than one. But no one is ungifted. We just have the unwilling to use their gifts. Now, 
I can go back up to the pulpit and grab the other Bible and read that long list that Paul gave where he keeps talking about the same spirit, the same spirit, the same spirit. Paul gets really, really wordy. Kind of like some women I know. <laughs> Eugene Peterson wrote a book called The Message. It's a paraphrase of the Bible that is good enough that our former Bishop of the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference, Peter Weaver, it's what he used when he preached. So I figure I'm on good, good grounds using it now. So just to keep it simple, Eugene Peterson in, uh, reinterprets that piece of scripture by saying, everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and all kinds of, to all kinds of people. And the variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. To me, that's a little bit more, it's a little clearer, a little bit more clearer. My jaw doesn't want to work this morning. But it's a little bit easier for me to understand. Because when I look down there, wise counsel. Any of you ever had a friend that when you have a problem, you, that was just the person you went to talk to. Not that you always did everything they said, but at least you knew you'd get at least what you, you might get what you need. You might not follow it, but at least you'd get it. Clear understanding. Just the ability to see clearly the way forward. Healing the sick. We're not talking miraculous Arise and walk. No, we're talking just the ability to minister to people in a way that they find it both healing of both body and spirit. Proclamation. Proclamation comes in a lot of ways. Some people do it with a children's message. Some people do it with lovely voices. By the way, I'd love to steal your choir. Some people do it with a keyboard. Other people with a big mouth. But the ability to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ in whatever way we're given to do it. The ability to distinguish between spirits. Now, I have a little trouble with that one, and I'm not going to be able to flesh that out for you today. But the one I always thought is the one that people talk about the most is the speaking in tongues. The people who think that in order to proclaim yourself saved, you have to have the ability to speak in tongues. Not you might have the ability, but you have to have the ability. I actually had someone tell me one time when I told them that I was a United Methodist minister, ordained, had been preaching in the pulpit for, I think at the time it was 12 years, and they literally went bleh, 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 bleh. and I said, what? And they said, well, if you're, if you're saved, you've got to be able to speak in tongues. And I said, no, I don't have to. I said, that's not one of the gifts I've been given. And they were flabbergasted that I would deny it. And I said, and I don't think you should either. And they said, why? I said, the scriptures tell us that if your gift is the ability to speak in tongues, but there's no one, no one around to interpret for you, you should sit down and shut up. If you're to speak in tongues when there's no one there to interpret, to bring meaning to what you're saying, the only reason you're doing it is because it makes you feel good. It puts this, the spotlight of attention on you. I sometimes have had a lot of trouble and out of, the, out of all the things that have ever had me question 
my calling to ministry, doing what I'm doing right now, is the reason. I stand up in front of a group of people after spending a week studying, and I profess my ability to proclaim the message of God as I have found it through Scripture and impart it, and I expect people to hear it and listen and understand. And it sometimes make me, makes me feel like, am, am I proclaiming Jim McNair or am I proclaiming Jesus Christ? And then I realized one day that, well, let, let me do this the easy way. Seeing as how he's one of the people I know, Bill, where'd you go to school? William Smith. William? Penn. William, William Penn. Okay. And, uh, Patty. North Allegheny. North Allegheny. Folks, first I went to Alabama, down in Alabama, I went to a place called Troy State. And then I went to Troy State again. And then when I finally decided to go to seminary, I went to Eastern Baptist Seminary. And the, you, you know what the only difference between me and Bill and Patty is? It's not the job we're doing, it's where we went to school. That's the only difference. Me standing here with this collar around my neck makes me no one special. I'm just a child of God doing what the Spirit has given me to do to the best of my poor ability. And in, and in doing so, I hope I'm not putting my foot in my mouth and I hope I'm imparting something. But Bill runs the ushers for this church, which is an important job. And Patty, so far I've known her to be in the choir and she writes, she writes the checks, so she must have something to do with the money. <laughs> and she's, she's been the labor leader twice. The labor leader twice. She's, she's using her gifts to proclaim Jesus Christ to the world. And Bill is using his, and I'm using mine. And just because I'm standing here, that doesn't make mine any more special. Just like the person speaking in tongues is not any more special than anyone else, because it all has to weave together if the church of God is going to be a, an agent of change in the world. I know people who their, their ministry is prison. Twice a week, this one guy I know, he goes to the prison down in Chester County, and he leads Bible studies, and it's he, he does all kinds of wonderful things, and he talks about it, and when he talks about it, I am just enraptured by it, and I realize I could not do what he's doing for all the money in the world, because that's not my gift, but it is his, and I know someone else who several times a month they go down into philadelphia and they get on their soapbox about social justice and they tell me about it and i realize not only could i not do what they're doing i don't want to do what they're doing because as they talk about it not once do they mention that they're doing it because they're trying to be in ministry to people through Jesus Christ. They're doing it because that makes them feel good. They love being in front of the camera. I could mention the name of you, or I, I could show you a picture, and you might even recognize the person, because every time something's going on on City Hall, they're up front and center. But when they talk about it, they're not. They don't mention they're doing it for the love of God. They mention they're doing it because things have to change. 
And I agree, things have to change. But why do things have to change? I mentioned in the first service that John Wesley is, was a very prolific writer, and there was a there is one of his sermons that I dearly love to read. I I don't read it every year, but probably I don't go three years in a row without reading it at least once. It's called Almost Christian. And as I told him before, if you've got 35 to 45 minutes with nothing to do, call, call it up if you can find it online. Because in it, Wesley is chastising people who are doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. Is I, what he's saying is you've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to accomplish these things, but you're doing it for all the wrong reasons because you're not doing it for the love of God. If you're in ministry to others, but you're doing it just because you think you should, or just because you, you think it'll make you look good, if you're not doing it because Jesus Christ loves them and so do you, then you who cares? because you're not proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a story that I didn't share earlier. A reporter was following around Mother Teresa. He was doing a story on her. Some of you may have heard the story before. But he watched her as she took the bandages off of a man who had gangrene in his lower leg. Now, those of any of you who've ever been around hospitals of gangrene, let me tell you, the stench is almost unbelievable. I mean, it reeks. It is, it is hard on the, on the stomach to keep food in if, when you're around gangrene. But, and she took the guy's bandages off and she scrubbed his wounds and she debrided it and she put it on ointment and she rewrapped it up. The whole time the uh, reporter was standing there trying to not gag. And when, they were, when, when she was done and he was following her out, he said, ma'am, I wouldn't do what you just did for a million dollars. And she turned to him and she said, and sir, neither would I. Why do we do what we're doing? If we're doing it because it makes us big in the eyes of our neighbors, we're doing it for the wrong reason. If we're doing it because it proclaims the message of Jesus Christ, we're doing it for the right reasons. And I would rather do the, I almost said the wrong thing for the right reasons, but I'd rather do the right thing for the right reason than the right thing for the wrong reason. Because in doing so, one way I might lead someone to Jesus Christ and the other, I wouldn't be. I used to tell people, if you would have known me back before I came back to church, from the time I was about 17 to the time I was 29, my 12 prodigal years, you would have thought I was the nicest guy you ever met. Because I was. I mean, literally, you would never, if you had never met anyone as pleasant as I was. And you know why? Because I didn't care at all about you or anyone else. But by being nice to you, you'd be nice back to me and it made my life easier. Think about that for a second. The only reason I was being nice to people was because it made my life easier. And then I met the God of Paul, or Saul who became Paul. I met the God of Peter and Simon. I met the Jesus Christ that had been trying to get a hold of me for years. And in doing so, I stopped doing things for myself and I started doing things for God. I went from zero Bible study to leading Bible study. I went from zero Sunday school to teaching Sunday school. I wound up in a pulpit, folks. And it was 
And I stopped doing it because it made me look good. Although I still have that voice in the back of my head saying, Jim, keep your ego out of it. Because, and I, I do my best, and hopefully I, I do a good job. But I come because I've read the scripture and the scripture talks to me and I think I understand it in a way and I try to help you understand it in the same way. And I just take my little thread and weave it in and it goes together with Les is doing lay reading today and the choir doing their thing and the woman who does the, the video stuff and the, the children's messages and all the other threads of spirit that are flowing through this church and together we, we make a cloth, a sturdy cloth that can, can withstand, they can, they, they can, we can wrap around people to help them withstand the winds and the cold and the ice and the, the, the arrows of uncertainty. If you are a caregiver, do so. If you can impart wisdom, do so. If you're one of those people that can just listen to people, and in the process of listening, give them peace, well then, listen. You don't have to do what I do. Matter of fact, I'm glad you don't. I have enough trouble doing it myself. You don't have to be able to sing like this wonderful choir. You don't have to be able to play. Find what your gift is and use it. And in doing so, proclaim Jesus Christ. I'm going to leave you with one story that I, well, not really a story, an adage I heard. Uh, a retreat group I belong to. They said, not everyone you're going to meet has ever read the Bible. But if they know you, they'll know that you're a Christian. And they'll watch you and how you live your life. So you may be the only Bible your neighbor ever reads. And what does your Bible say about Jesus Christ and his love? Think about that. You may be the only Bible your neighbor ever reads. And what does your Bible say about Jesus Christ and his love? My friends, I've been blessed to be here for the last few weeks. I've really enjoyed meeting you all. And I know Rick is going to continue on with his wonderful ministry. Support him in what he does. He'll support you in yours, in your ministries. And together, Quaker United Methodist Church, Quaker Town United Methodist Church, can continue to be a, that shining light on the hill that proclaims Jesus Christ and all in, in all his love. Again, thank you. And now one of my favorite hymns, hymn 114, Many Gifts, One Spirit. Please stand.
my brothers and sisters, look inside yourself. Find that which you have been given, that you've been tasked to share. And remember that the last thing Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach my gospel to every creature. You've been given the gifts. You've been given the task. The only question is, will you take up the journey? I pray that you do. Go in grace. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.